Okay, hi everyone. So this is on the screen, uh, my name is Tom Ford. I'm, I'll be giving a talk about digital generation. It's kind of loosely titled Roguelocks and the Three Graphs, unfortunately. So, if it gets to work. So, just to kick off, uh, if you don't know me and the stuff I've done, I've mainly written some seven day RL, starting with DD Rogue in 2009. Sort of dungeon dive, whereby um, if you did particular movement patterns, you've got special abilities like moving around enemies or jumping off walls, etc. 2010, I extended the band into a kitchen sink, seven day RL called Princess RL, which was sort of take on Princess Maker 2 with lots and lots of roguelike elements and not many Princess elements. Um, in 2012, I took a break from doing seven day RLs, I did a commercial Android game called Dungeon Descendants, which was available. Um, returning to real roguelikes in 2013, I made a sort of stealthy sneak around patrolling robots game, again in Ashley on Flatline RL. And I kind of extended that um, this year into a graphical um, version with sort of a plot um, called Trauma RL. I'll be talking about the Secret Generation today, and I'll be referring to this game a little bit in terms of some of the approaches I used. So, this is something Darren said a long time ago. Put it up in the last LDC as well. So, we're talking about can we make procedural level generation act a bit like a human when you know, your me might be handcrafting a level. So, Darren said something along the lines of might put a small bolt in the north of a level, keep things connected in its place, or once a type, I'll follow the orc theme and choose some orc assassins. An artifact reward, no a large pile of gold, and you know, then in my store. Or maybe take a dead end room in the west, dead end like something interesting in them. Let's put a, a potion in a chest to be guarded by mages. But the path of the dungeon entrance in here is to the north, so I'll put the mages uh, between the view and the treasure. It's all the kind of decisions you might make yourself, but I'm uh, a roguelike developer, I don't want to do any, and um, made level generation, or at least as little as possible. So what, what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is see how much of this stuff I can get the computer to do. And here are my, my three graphs in the title. So first of all, when I say graph, well, I'm talking about graph in the computer science sense. But all this really means is you've got some nodes representing something, or vertices, connected by some edges. And that's basically all we need to know for the purpose of this talk. So I'm suggesting that to help us out doing our procedural generation, we should use, as I used, three different graphs. The first graph is a graph of levels. So each of these nodes represents a level, and the edges between them represent how you can move basically from one level to another by stairs or elevators or whatever. So that's a really sort of zoomed out bird's eye view of your game. The next graph is the graph of each room. So here, and I'll show in a bit more detail later, each node represents the room, and the doors between them are represented by lines on my graph. Finally, the, the sort of most detailed um, graph is actually the map you're playing on. So what I'm suggesting here is this um, pretty standard looking roguelike room represented by quite a complicated graph. I've got a node here that connects to that square, that square, that square, that square, so I can move in any of those directions. Um, likewise, this is a node that connects to all the votes. So that's the most detailed and most complicated graph. And I'm suggesting by utilizing the decision I'm making, secret generation, utilizing the right zoom level, if you like, I can um, make some intelligent decisions and make them in a reasonably speedy way. I so in this case, I'm actually letting Lib T or D take care of this. So I don't know how it's being represented, but I suspect it's in an array format rather than a traditional. Again, yeah, there's a number of ways of representing graphs in memory, but um, these ones I'm representing again. I'm using a library, but in a more traditional way. I mean, you know, for example. I've a matrix or just a list of edges associated with each node. So a little about the game, I'd say I'll reference occasionally. So Tor is my experiment in graph-based procedure generation. It's 
So the model after the system shot really, so it's kind of action adventure game, rather than just some roguelike, although it's basically either roguelike, it's got roguelike mechanics. It's set on the space station, it's been taken over by Rogue AI. See what I did there? It aimed to have a semi-linear plot-based structure, like a um, good action adventure game, that changes significantly in multiple plays. So you to be doing exactly the same thing every time you play the next game. Have some non-linear exploration, be more choice in the player, it's not just going through a series of rooms. And have some procedural plot exposition and strategic textual clues. So it's similar to how we were talking in the uh, previous talk. Um, about giving the player hints as to what the story is, instead of putting a load of text up at the beginning and saying, hey, the story is this. So, as I say, this talk's primarily about the graphs, so I'm going to start, well, basically I'm going to concentrate on the graph rather than the game for most of the talk. So, on here, on the um, left, I've got a very kind of linear structure for your levels. Now, if you've got a game like Rogue or Hangband, this is basically how it works. You've got one level connected to the next, connected to the next, connected to the next, until you get to the bottom. It's just linear. Now, if we're simulating something that isn't just a dungeon, in my case, I say I'm simulating a space station, then I want to have a slightly more interesting um, way in which the levels connect. So, at the top here, I've got a medical level, then that's connected to a sort of atrium, kind of transport level. And from there, you can go to a flight deck, the storage level, or the science level. I like this kind of branching design. It's something that System Shock had, because it leads to some sort of player decisions. You know, if I go to storage or science, so let's go down and see what it's like, and then see how hard it is, am I ready for it? If not, I'll come back and go the other way, rather than just sort of being forced down a, a linear um, route if you are in so many games. It makes it a bit harder for the game designer, because we need to sort of, balancing a linear um, so that was really easy, make it harder each time. When you're balancing a game like this, um, a number of ways of doing it, but if you're just at the start putting monsters in different areas, as I do pretty much, you've got to worry about, um, okay, you know, if you want these branches to have different difficulties, so they're a reasonable decision, you also want there to be a ramp in difficulty, but hey, the user could be prepared to go down to the archaeology first, and then go down to the commercial, so if they've leveled up sufficiently going down this route, you still want the other route to be challenging. So it gives you, um, let's say, a, a more difficult challenge in the game designer. So that's actually the structure I used in, in my game. Moving on, a more complicated structure, which is actually sort of more representative of a commercial game, would be something that's a bit more sort of system shop like. So in my previous graph, I showed some branches. I showed that you could move between levels basically in either direction. In this case, what you often see in games is, you know, you can go down a certain deep uh, deck here, so you go right up the bottom, but that might open up a door that leads you right back to the start. You don't want the door at the start taking to the bottom, so it has to be sort of one way door if you want to transition between your levels. Um, so, again, this is, this is a more complicated structure, and my game engine doesn't support this. I think in, in these kind of structures, really the, how the level connectivity evolves is very much tied into your main plot or quest. So I'll just tell you how my sort of top level level graph looked in Trauma RL. So effectively, this is a, just straight out of the game what the level arrangement would look like in one playthrough. If I was to run it again, then the ordering of the levels of connectivity between would change. So, for example, in this one you've got a flight deck directly off the lower atrium. In a, if you play it again, you might find the flight deck you have to go through the ecology first, or, or through science and storage, for example. When it came to balancing, what I did was relatively simple. I said, okay, monsters on each level are going to be based on the depth in the graph. So, if science happens to be here this time, it's depth two, the monster will be about that difficult. Um, if I go down further to storage, that's going to be difficulty three. There's also quite a lot of randomness in how difficult difficulty two level is, which gives the user some sort of meaningful choice here. It's not an ideal system, but I was kind of limited to only had seven days. So to conclude my first section, this sort of level graph gives you an overall structure for your game and Helps you out with balancing, right? If I didn't have this structure, I didn't have it in memory, I didn't, couldn't manipulate it, 
would be hard for me to, to balance these different levels, so I wouldn't know when the user was going to get to them. But by looking at this graph and thinking, okay, I'll sort them by depth or something like that, sort them by a root, that gives me a handle on balancing a, a procedurally generated level structure. So hopefully that's, that's clear. I'm going to move on now to probably the most interesting part um, of the graphs, which is the graph that represents the connectivity of different routes. So three pieces in this slide. If you look at the back, um, so the background graphic, this is um, one form RL game. And all the rooms in the game link together into a representative graph. So that's actually what the game looks like in terms of routes. So all that, that connectivity is, is all correct. The game is actually made up of, of levels when you play it, but they're connected by elevators. And the elevators are just links linking one sort of, if you like, mini level graph to, to the others. So I've zoomed in a bit on level one over here. I'm trying to go somewhere where hopefully it's reasonably illustrative. This is a screenshot from the game, but I've overlaid the numbers of the rooms. So if we start, say, from room three, which is here on the graph, it's here. It connects to corridors six, eight, and four. If I go to four, then that connects to one, Next to some other stuff, including corridor 19. So hopefully that's clear, um, what the relationship between the actual level I'm playing is and the graph I make at the same time. Okay. I say each node of this represents a room, and each line, each edge, represents, say, a doorway. Okay. So, fingers crossed, my laptop moves on. But what's, what's the point of having this graph? Okay. So bear in mind, I'm procedurally generating this. I don't know what it's going to look like beforehand. Um, but after my first stage of level generation, I'm presented with this. This is a graph of all the rooms that say in my game. And as humans, we can immediately identify some things. We can identify that, say, room 17 is dead end. Room 6 is dead end. These two are branches. So let's say it had something room 17, but it's like a choke point of room 60. There's a bit of a cycle here. Okay. And when you're manipulating the graph on the computer, it's exactly those kind of heuristics that you're trying to pull out. You're trying to use those to aid your level generation. So a couple of concrete examples. Let's say you come in at, at room one and you leave at room 15. Okay. So those are those fits. One thing that turns out to be really important is critical path detection. So by analysing this graph, you can see what, what's the path the user's got to take to get out of the level, basically. And what we can see here, excluding the loop, is I know what rooms it's going to have to go through in order to get out. Okay. And so what I might reasonably do is say, well, I'll put sort of like a halfway visible monster about halfway through. I can identify the, the edge of the room in which I should place that monster. And we, it's the kind of thing we expect when we're playing games. We expect there's a critical path to go through, and there'll probably be some important monster on there. So it's kind of human-like um, level design choice. Something else we expect are kind of side quests. So, again, using branch detection algorithms, I can detect that, hey, these are branches. They're off the side. What do we expect when we have side branches? We expect kind of a side quest. So why don't I take... Um, this node here, what do I know about it? It's dead end, and it's also the furthest dead end away from this critical path. So it's basically, if the user really wants to explore off the beaten path, I can identify the node we're going to. So that's a natural node to put some treasure in, effectively. I've got some treasure, I want a monster. I know this is a branch. You can't bypass a monster I stick here. So again, using these heuristics, designs, that allows me to intelligently place my monster. Similarly, I might just put a monster here and no treasure. It's more like winding the player up a bit. Bear in mind, I'm not making these decisions. I'm just writing code and make decisions based on how the graph looks. OK, so broadly, it, um, I can put obstacles in the critical path. I can identify things that are a long way from the critical path. Identify branches. Identify dead ends. Identify the distance between nodes in terms of roots. So those are all techniques I use in the game. These are all supported by the engine. One of the other things which um, the game does, it takes that a bit further. Rather than just placing items and monsters, it says, hey, can we take the idea of a, sort of a main quest that runs through the game? Can I semi-intelligently build that into 
my strap, my game using the graph. I've got the same graph here. Bear in mind that when I showed you the whole trauma RL graph, it's a really massive graph that spans multiple levels. So I can effectively build a main quest that spans multiple levels using that graph, using that graph there. So very simply, let's have an, an entrance. As I say, this is a space station that's taken over by a rogue AI. So let's make ultimately the goal for the user to get to the escape pods. Okay. So where do I put the escape pods? Well, I decide arbitrarily I'm going to make the entrance there. I want to put the escape pods just as far away from the entrance as I possibly can. That just means the player's going to see as much of the content as, as is available. If I put the escape pod in room two, that'd be kind of crap. So even for simple things like that, you have to use the heuristics to position things sensitive. But that would be a relatively straightforward thing to do. So let's make stuff a little bit harder. Let's say to operate the escape pods, we do two things. You need to pick up a fuel can, fill it full of space fuel. Um, and you need to go to a cargo bay door switch and just open the cargo bay doors, otherwise you'll sign into them. Okay. And where am I going to put those? Well, the heuristic I kind of used in the game was, let's just put them in, in dead ends. Okay. I'm not worrying about where they are, I just say, find some dead ends, stick these things there. Again, I, that's still a little bit too easy, so let's make things a little harder to wear. Let's lock down this um, cargo bay door switch. So only the captain's allowed to operate the cargo bay doors, so if you play want to operate them, they need to find the captain's ID. What heuristic might I use to place them out? I might say, let's find a dead end, which is a long way away from the cargo bay door switch, and doesn't have anything else important in it. Okay, so in that case, my heuristic identifies screw six. I slap my captain's ID there. What do we use the player have to do now? Grab the fuel, grab the captain's ID, operate the switch, go to the escape pods, game over. But, let's come back to my critical path analysis. Let's say our poor old player has gone through a critical path, gone down to the escape pods, found the cargo bay door switch, and is like, well, what do I do? This thing doesn't work. And yeah, okay, you need a captain's ID, but that's a long way away. And I can say, hey, you know, locked out, you need captain's ID. You say, well, where's that? I mean, this is a poor game experience, I want my money back. So, in order to help them out, identify the critical path between the entrance and, say, the cargo bay door. I know the player will have to stumble through these rooms before he finds that cargo base switch. So I've got a clue in here. I'll put something like the captain saying, you know, I always keep my ID in my cabin's wardrobe. You know, that's on the medical deck or whatever. If I just put this down randomly, it's going to be no good. Because chances are the player will never stumble over it. So I identify the path through the graph. Halfway along, I stick down the captain's log. So now the user hopefully has not only a clue, but also something that should work quite well. You know, oh, I found out, first of all, where the captain's ID is. I don't know why I need it. I find then, secondly, something that says, hey, I need captain's ID. I put the two and two together, and I figure out how to, how to solve this particular challenge. Fortunately, that would still be too easy for the player. So, that extra complexity. Let's um, make sure this fuel is locked down as well. So let's put a door on the front of the fuel. And say, no, you can't come in here, it's the engineering bay, high security, blah, blah, blah. In order to do that, you need an engineering ID. Okay. Well, now we have a bit of a problem with doors, because doors lock off part of the graph. So if I was to take my engineering ID and stick it behind the engineering door, well, then the player would just be screwed. There'd be no way of ever getting that ID behind the door it opens. So my heuristic now is I can apply it somewhere else, like I decided in a dead end, but I also have to reject these two squares. I'm not allowed to place it there. Still too easy. So what I might do is I might decide that the engineer was in the canteen when he was killed, and that's behind the locked canteen door to get into the canteen. You need to get a canteen ID to open the canteen door to get the engineering ID to open the engineering door to get the fuel we need to escape. But this is even more interesting from a placement point of view, because I can't put the canteen ID behind the canteen door, that's kind of obvious, but I also can't put it behind the engineering door, because you need the canteen ID to open the canteen door to get the engineering ID to, put it to open the engineering door, if you see what I mean. So when you're placing this, it's kind of not obvious, but you're not allowed to place Canteen ID either here or here. 
As you can imagine, if this got arbitrarily complicated, then it would be relatively tough to figure out what nodes you were allowed to place an ID or T in and which nodes you weren't. Okay. So, just to complete this, when the laptop catches up, this is the full quest now in all its glory. So, at the entrance, you might stumble along, pick up a campaign ID, what's that called? Don't know. Pick up a clue about where the captain's log is. Start with the captain's ID roll from the captain's log. Stumble across this button. Oh, I need to press that. Go and get that ID. Oh, there's a locked door here. That's interesting. Oh, my key I found earlier opens the canteen door. Got my ID, got my fuel. Get to the escape pods. Escape. So, if you like, it's a multi stage quest which you're very, very used to in sort of action adventure games. What I've done is I've taken a graph. Bear this, bear in mind, map will be different each time. I sort of automatically make sensible decisions about where I can place the different parts of the quest. Okay, so it will play differently each time. You might find different things in different order, um, and certainly in different places. But um, one person doesn't feel this design. You're kind of forcing the player to back there again and again because you're putting everything on the dead ends. So if you look at the graph, the player is like going up and down, up and down the whole time. It doesn't get a bit. Um, not, not boring, but a bit uh, for, for the player. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that's. I think that's a much, not so much forcing exploration, but forcing to backtrack again and again. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable point. Bear in mind, I'm showing a relatively simplistic graph here with only 15 nodes. There is a lot of backtracking. Um, you can alter your. My point really is that having this map and using um, these kind of heuristics, you can set up the quest wherever you like. For example, you could have a heuristic where each goal was at a deeper level, um, but on different branches. So, they're not limited just to using simple heuristics I've talked about. The backtracking issue is certainly one that was at the top of my mind when I actually designed the game around this. The way I was, well, two ways around it. I tried to avoid using heuristics that caused a lot of backtracking. And the second thing I considered was sort of respawning monsters, because the thing you don't want to do is effectively clear out a level, find a door, go find a key somewhere else, have to backtrack all the way through an entirely empty level in order to open that door. So, yes, there are a number of um, a number of other considerations I think you've got to take into account when doing this kind of analysis. Uh, I'm interested what you do if you run out of dead ends, or if there is no critical path because there are two ways and stuff like that. Because you already have the level generated. Yeah, I'm actually going to approach that to that point later as well. Um, take into um, account your, your two points. One is, if you haven't any dead ends left, well, you can make a decision like, let's just put it anywhere, or let's put it in a dead end that's already got something in it. Um, you need those kind of fallbacks in your code. Or the other option, which I actually do, is if I run out of dead ends, I just throw away the whole space station and make a new one. I hope it's going to have more dead ends, effectively. Um, with a critical path, what I do is I identify where the loops are, and I just avoid, well, I should, I don't actually do this. What I should do is identify where the loops, where the loops are, which I do, um, and then just avoid those nodes when I want to put something you have to encounter. I only put something you have to encounter that's sort of a non-ambiguous part of the critical path. And that's a good point as well. So once you, once you force play with you go everywhere, what does it matter if on a path that's not uh, the one you... I mean, they, they've seen every room except the one one of those uh, that's, uh, that's optional. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a good why point. Why not go that ahead and that put something there too? Yeah, I mean, what, I, what, I, what you typically want with a good path is to provide either an obstacle or a clue that the user has to get in order to improve their experience. So I would give them a critical piece of information or a critical challenge. So, um, again, this graph looks very, very busy because I've only got 15 rooms and there's a hell of a lot to do here. Where if you actually use the whole Tour Rail map, it's got 200 nodes. So I've got a lot more flexibility in terms of where I put things. But getting the heuristics right is, is really important. Do you, do you try collecting statistics for common maps fail and how many? Yeah, I think, but, well, it's very easy to create the statistics because in during development, I made it such that when the map wasn't good enough, the game crashed. And so I can tell you exactly how many times it happens. Well, it happens about one in ten. Yeah, I mean, it's about one in ten where it fails. 
I mean, it only takes about a second to create the whole space station, so a uh, user providing I put my try catches incorrectly won't notice. I was really interesting. What you said about actually sort of having the backup for when what you want to happen fails, and you still have to be backup for well, okay, then for then so, for then so. In the final version, how sort of uh, where's the balance between having to go to the backup and having to abandon the station and make a new one? Does it much prefer to abandon and make a new one, or, or does it prefer to use backups? Yeah, um, I don't think my game is enormously clever. Basically. Because the map is so big and the number of things you've got to do is relatively small, it almost never has to fall back. But, um, yeah, I don't know exactly the... Because there's a couple of ways the map generation can fail. Um, so I don't know the exact statistics, but it's very rare. Um, but if you were to play the game, you'd realize, you know, there's a main quest with about this many things to do over 200 rooms. You, you first generate the map and then extract the graph from it, right? Not the other way around. Correct. And I'll talk about a bit more about that in a, a bit. So I think there's a general problem there um, that I haven't solved. I just want to touch on um, another artifact you get out of this um, engine, which is effectively you get a graph of what you have to do in what order. So by the nature of the library, it pulls out the escape pod requires the cargo doors and fuel. The fuel requires opening the engineering door, requires the engineering ID, requires the canteen door, open, requires the canteen ID. This graph is really important because it allows them to do the thing I talked about before, which is avoid impassable nodes, avoid deadlocks. You don't want key A behind door B and key B behind door A because you can't, you can't solve it. So if I was to lock off the canteen ID, I would put another door in here. And what my algorithm does, it just traverses the tree backwards to the top and says, oh, OK, I have to avoid any area behind the canteen door and any area behind the engineering. What it means is whenever I add a, um, another quest item, I have to add it onto this graph um, as well as into the game. So I'm not going to go into any of the graph algorithms I use here pretty much, but I'll just give you a very brief overview of the, how the sort of structure of the algorithm works. So I have a concept of an objective. Um, this is any kind of quest thing you have to do. It requires a certain number of clues. So that could be, for example, the fuel um, is required by the by the um, escape pods. It produces clues. So if you've got something which is a sequence of quests, like pressing this button here allows you to open the escape pods, the way that would work is this button here requires a clue which is the captain's ID, and it produces a clue which is basically escape pod will open now, if you like. So that's how you, that's how you build quests. You've all got the concept of optional clues. These are actually required to open or activate the objective. They might be something like a log file um, or something that's useful, like you know, a power-up for doing this quest isn't required. It allows me to make sure I, I know when that will be available to the user, but they don't actually have to take it in order to complete the quest. Clues are things like IDs. They're actually equivalent to an objective that produces a clue and requires nothing, which is handy from our own point of view. And the other thing is doors. And doors are effectively objectives that lock out part of your graph. And again, they require certain clues. Um, typically, don't produce clues, although they could. Again, this is getting a little bit detailed, but this is the crux of the, the business. To build a dependency graph, if an objective is dependent upon other objectives that yield their clues, um, you have to add them to the graph. And objectives are dependent upon doors which block access from the entrance to their location. So feel free to read that afterwards and figure out what it means. How does that actually work when I'm using this? Well, it's implemented in C sharp. Um, what I this is sort of pseudo C sharp. Whenever I want to place something, I've got a heuristic like give me the dead ends something, and I've got give me valid nodes to place this objective. So I get a list of all the places I can possibly put this clue or request or whatever. When I say, give me all the dead ends, find the intersection of these two sets, which will give me all the nodes which are where I want to put it from a game point of view and where I'm allowed to put it. Okay. If that's empty, then I do what you suggested and, and fall back to, or just give me any old node, for example. It's actually quite hard to implement, so it's, this library is fully unit tested, and I stress this as well by making massive graphs with ridiculously huge numbers of quests and just making sure the, the graphs are solvable. In terms of algorithmic complexity, um, all the algorithms I use are pretty much 
order n, where n is the number of nodes in the graph, so nothing here is, is very slow. And that's all cycle detection, graph tra traversing, um, graph solubility testing, so that n squared. So building a complex quest map in a 500 node um, graph takes about a one second on one piece of so It's not slow. Just to complete this section, if my laptop is going to play ball, I'll show you the, this is the dependency graph in the actual game, so it gives you some idea of the number of locked doors and quests which are in here. I was actually encouraged by my artist to reduce the number of locked doors and keys because of backtracking problems, etc. I think the game's quite playable like this, for the size of the game it is. You don't have that much backtracking to do. Now hopefully, if I get a chance to speak again, I'll show you the game and give you some idea of um, the actual kind of quests that are in here because they're not as simple as these sort of lock key ones I, I displayed earlier. The final map um, I'm going to talk about briefly is the, the game map itself. As I mentioned, each point, each square you can move on, can be modelled as a vertex, and you've got four-way movement, you've got four edges to your surrounding area. And our favourite pathfinding algorithm is using roguelikes like A-star or really graph algorithms. So you shouldn't be surprised, but this is a graph. What can I use this graph map for? Well, previously I've talked all about putting monsters and items in particular rooms. Clearly I need to know where in the room I'm going to put these um, items and monsters that I've assigned. So I do stuff like um, use this graph, as everyone else does, to you know, locate boundaries. I've got security cameras <coughs> in the boundary of the room. I want to distribute cover in a relatively sort of more or less um, homogeneous distribution throughout the room, or Gaussian distribution in my case. So basically, uh, you use the room graph to determine the gross structure of your quest, and you use the map graph really on a room by room basis to make sure um, you know, everything is placed where it should. Finally, the map graph is pretty useful as well, um, because if you think my room graph, my level graph, the player experiences this, but they only experience it through the actual map itself. It's just a construct I use to, to build the game. So this is a, a bug report I have. Here's the player. Here's the escape pod launch button. And here's an impenetrable wall of decorative terrain. Which is a bit of a shame. So we've got all the way through, done all the backtracking, opened all the quests, and was stuck tantalizingly close to escaping because I screwed up. So the room map is very important. After this, I put in a, a check to make sure that every quest item was accessible by looking for its connectivity in the room map as well as, sorry, in the, in the actual player map as well as the, the higher level graph. And somebody made a really good point earlier. Well, how do you go about actually generating these things? And that's got to be in order, right? Because traditionally, in roguelikes, we just build a level at the, sort of the most granular level that I just showed in the previous slide. Um, that is indeed what I do. But when you're actually thinking about this from a quest point of view, you tend to think about something like this. Like, you know, I want to place the captain's cabin a long way away from the cargo bay, because I'm close to board on this quest. But I'd like the captain's cabin to be a 25 by 25 room in the space of this wardrobe, for example. But now it's really hard, because I'm trying to build both the map and the actual physical space and this graph thing for controlling my quest simultaneously. Okay. And if you're working in a regular kind of map where you're limited by geometry, i.e. Like, like rooms can't overlap, that's kind of problematic. Um, it's a re I think it's a really hard optimization problem. I don't really know. I would say that some things like Jeff Lake's maps, which allow to freely overlap each other, would probably get around this. You could quite happily say, I'll oh, stick a big room there, a small room there, make sure you've got a room far enough away. So rather than the way I do it, which is take a, create a regularly built level, find out what the graph, the root graph looks like for rooms, and then make quest placement decisions, I would like to sort of build that up sort of dynamically, but I can't do that that way. So finally, I'll just show you how Trauma RL does it. So first of all, I build the level structure. I determine somewhat randomly these branches, so different levels connect different levels at the time. I then build a conventional map for each level, um, and I build this graph at the same time to allow me to make quest placement decisions. But each level contains a number of, of 10 by 10 areas, which I can use for my quests. 
So after building the levels, I then do all this quest um, distribution, lock doors, that kind of thing. And if I decide, okay, the escape pod's going to be on this level this time, the captain's camera's going to be on this level this time, I look for some of these 10 by 10 rooms I could go in advance, and I substitute those with, for example, pre-made cabins. I don't do this ahead of a lot in the game, so I only have seven days. But, um, uh, then that, a little bit of this does go on. It's not, I don't think it's a really great way of doing things, but it gives me the flexibility to change up levels after I've decided what the quests are going to be, but make the levels first, so I get the quest map, so I can figure out the quests that we're doing. So there you go. So I hope, in some ways, I've been convincing that um, you can make sensible procedural quest and placement decisions by not just blindly throwing things onto your pre-made level, but actually looking at the structure of how the rooms connect together and using some graph algorithms to turn heuristics to placings in a more sensible, more human-like way. Um, I think certain game design decisions occur most naturally at different levels of granularity. Using different graphs, you have different decisions, it's really good. And I hope through you know, um, iterating on this, on this technique, we can get towards procedural games that rival human-like level design. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much.